Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Imagine a time when the echoes of colonial rule vibrated through the Indian subcontinent and the quest for education and progress faced formidable challenges. In the midst of this turbulent era emerged a, vi emerged a visionary, a beacon of enlightenment, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. His life was a testament of resilience, his work a symphony of educational reform, and his legacy, his legacy left a mark on the tapestry of modern India. Join me as we unveil the captivating journey of this man. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, born in the year 1817, and he died in the year 1898. He was, bo he was born in the city of Delhi in India, which was the capital of the Mughal dynasty. His family had close ties to the Mughal sultans. For example, his grandfather, his maternal grandfather was the vizier of Akbar Shah II. Akbar Shah II and his father was the personal advisor to the sultan. However, the East Indian Company had replaced the traditional power system of the Sultan and the Sultan had ended up just as a figurehead. He was raised in a wealthy family and learned about politics early on and was educated according to Mughal tradition. He studied Persian, which was the language of politics, Arabic, which was the language in which Islamic debates were taking place, mathematics, medicine and literature. He had also memorized the Holy Quran at a young age and was great at sports, at practicing sports. When his father passed away, the financial situation of the family was in difficulty, so he had to start studying privately and worked with his elder brother who launched the first Urdu newspaper in India at that time. While searching for a more suitable job, a more sustainable job, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan analyzed his society. He saw that the Mughal power structure was declining and it was being replaced by the East Indian Company who, was, who were controlled by the British Empire. Hence, he decided to become a clerk uh, and, a, and later became a sub-judge for the East Indian uh, Company. In the year 1857, there would be an outbreak, a rebellion, a mutiny between the Muslim Hindu population and the British official. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was present at this mutiny. He tried to save as much people as he could and he stood on the side of the British. Later on, he would write a book called The Causes of the Indian Revolt, in which he will blame the unjust policies of the British uh, for causing this, this rebellion. In 1869, he would accompany his sons to England for their studies, where he would be exposed to the Western tradition and the Western way of life. Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, at a very young age, was influenced by the Naqshbandi Tariqa, a Sufi order a Sufi way of thinking in which his father was initiated and at a young age he, he too was initiated in the same tariqa, in the same Sufi order of the Naqshbandiya through the guidance of Shah Ghulam Ali. He was also influenced by Shah Waliullah Dahlawi and the Mujahideen movement. Shah Waliullah Dahlawi was a reformist thinker in India at that time. He called the people to reform the religion of Islam, to revive the religion of Islam and to redo ijtihad of the Islamic sciences. So Sayyid Ahmad Khan was deeply influenced by uh, Shah Waliullah Dahlawi's uh, thought. He was, opposed, uh, he was opposed to the Wahhabi and Ahl al-Hadith movement that would emerge later on from the Shah Waliullah mov movement. So Shah Waliullah wrote some books and uh, had a thinking. Later on this would develop and his followers, many of his followers would become Wahhabi and Ahl al-Hadith. 
Nevertheless, even though Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was influenced by Shah Waliullah Dahlawi, he would be opposed to the Wahhabis and to the Ahlul Hadith. At the early age of 23, his writing career had already started. His early works were more focused on the life of Muhammad Sallallahu the Muslim practices and social educational reforms. Whereas later on his works would be more in response to the Christian missionary activities in India and the Western historian distortion of Islam. His works would be in response to these two factors. Now let us dive deeply into his works. What did he write? exactly what were his, his books firstly when it comes to religious matters he wrote a book known as the delights of the heart a prose for the prophet muhammad sallam in the urdu language his second book in this in this matter is the true discourse also known as kalimatul kalimatul haq the true discourse it was a critique on the peer-murid relationship. Now, what is the peer and murid relationship? When it comes to Sufism, as I previously mentioned, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was deeply influenced by Sufism and by the Naqshbandi Tariqa. The Sufis have a relationship of peer and murid. The peer is the sheikh, it is the teacher, he is the master, he is the saint. And the murid is the follower, the student, the one who cleans his heart. The peer is the one whose heart is already clean and is teaching. The murid is the one who is seeking spiritual clean cleanliness. Now, he came in this book, The, the True Discourse. Sir uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan tries to reform this relationship. In what way? The book is divided into two parts. The first part deals with the peer, where Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, in a brief manner, he tries, I mean, I am summarizing it in a, in a brief manner. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan tries to, tries to present a view of the peer which is more in line with the Quran and the Sunnah. In what way? He argues that the peer, the master, the spiritual master, the one who cleans the heart of his pupils, must uh, the only one who has that title of peer, ultimate peer, the ultimate saint, is Muhammad Sawas, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet of Islam. He and only he is the ultimate peer. And anyone who claims to be a saint, anyone who claims to be a spiritual master, must be of the tradition of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He must follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the most. He must follow the Sunnah. He must follow the Quran. And Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan also had an interesting view. He saw Tariqa and Sharia as the same thing. There is no distinction between spirituality and between uh, between spirituality and the Sharia, the Islamic law. If one is to be spiritual, one is to obey the law of God. If you do not obey God, how can you be spiritual? Because spirituality is a connection between man and God. You must be the best servant in order to be the best uh, at spirituality, at clean cleanliness. This is in terms of the peer. So to summarize, the peer must be a follower of Muhammad. The only and ultimate peer is Muhammad Sallallahu The peer means a saint, one who cleanses the heart of his pupils. Moving on, the second part of the book deals with the murid, the student, and bayah. Now, what is the murid? The murid is the student, the one who is seeking spiritual cleanliness. And bayah is the pledge of allegiance. In a Sufi order, a student gives a pledge of allegiance to the to the teacher where uh, he is bound to that teacher whatever the peer whatever the saint says he is obligated to do or else it would be considered as a sin now she um sir sayyid ahmad khan was not in a uh, did not like this concept of murid and bayah he advocated for intellectual independence he advocated uh, he advocated for this independence of thought, which Islam championed. Islam champions the, for, uh, the thinking, uh, freeing of the mind. Islam champions freeing of the mind, liberation of intellectual thought. Hence, this concept of 
murid and bay'ah pledge of allegiance that if I don't follow everything that the peer says, I am a uh, sinner. This is contrary to the principles of Islam according to the comprehension of Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. So he brings a reformation when it comes to the relationship between the master of spirituality and the student of spirituality and what bounds them together. This is, uh, this is what he exposes in the book, The True Discourse. Now moving on, he writes another book, The Sunnah and the Rejection of Innovation. This book is an interesting one. For Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, Sunnah means anything that was practiced by the Prophet. It may also include the three best generations, so the Prophet, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and the at tabiin those who follow the Tabi'een. These, the practices that were common during this free period of time is what um, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan considers as Sunnah. And then whatever is added upon that after, whatever is added upon by the forefathers, by his forefathers, by the Muslims, is considered as innovation, as bid'ah, and must be removed from the religion because it is an add-on. It is not the true Islam. It is not the pure Islam. To reach pure Islam, you need to follow the Sunnah perfectly and remove all innovation. This is in accordance to the view of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. At the beginning, he was very rigid in this approach. He did for him cultural and civilizational innovation was the same as religious innovation. So it was all, all of them were not allowed be it cultural, civilizational, or religious, whatever innovation that did not exist at the time uh, that was added on to Islam is haram. Later on, he takes a more nuanced approach where he says that cultural and civilizational innovations can uh, do not count in, in the innovations, in the bid'ah. Rather, bid'ah is only re religious matters. This is a more nuanced approach that he adopts later on when he writes the second edition of the Sunnah and the rejection of Bidah. He also writes another book in the religious in the religious spectrum, a letter explaining the teaching of Tawassur Tasawur uh, Sheikh, which means visualizing within the image of the of one spiritual guide. Now, the Sufis had a practice where when you do the remembrance of God, you, you visualize your, uh, your teacher in your heart. You visualize your master in your heart so that you concentrate more. This, were, this concept was attacked by the uh, Ahlul Hadith because they said that there is no such thing in the Sunnah of Rasulullah. And so Sayyid Ahmad Khan def defended this concept, this concept that he deemed to be a practice of, of the Sahaba, of uh, spirituality, and which he deemed to be a good practice. Later on, in the year 1853, he translated pa pages from the book, The Alchemy of Happiness, from Al-Imam Al-Ghazali. Imam Al-Ghazali was a great spiritual teacher. He was a great uh, Sufi he was a great scholar of Islam and he had written a book known as The Alchemy of Happiness. And Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan found this book and translated many pages of the book. He also, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan also wrote a commentary on the Torah and the Gospel. Now previously, if you remember, we had talked about his early writings and his later writings. The early writings were more focused on social reforms, were more focused on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi were more focused on Muslim practices. And the second part of his writing, his later writing, were focused on the Western tradition and uh, the West in general, so that he may respond to the critiques that the West have of Islam. This is when we enter the second part of his writings. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan wrote a commentary on the Torah and the Gospel. The Torah, which is the book of the Jews, and the Gospel, which is the book of the Christian. Now, uh, when we talk about this book, 
we have to we have to keep in mind that the book was divided into three parts. The first part of the book is the perspective the Islamic perspective towards biblical writing. So Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan explains the Islamic perspective towards biblical writing. What does Islam say about the Bible, about the Torah, about the previous books? The second part of the book is a commentary on uh, on the book of Genesis from the uh, from uh, the Old Testament, and then the third part of the book is a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. He did this. He wrote this book in order to present the Islamic narrative when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the Torah, when it comes to the previous books. So Sayyid Ahmad Khan also wrote a famous essay entitled The Life of Muhammad. It was a response to the book of William Murr. Uh, I do not really know how to pronounce his name, but I know the first name is William. The second one is M-U-E-R. So, William wrote a book entitled The Life of uh, Mahomet. Uh, as he was concerned, as uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan was concerned about the portrayal of the West, uh, that the West had of Muhammad, he wrote this book because he was firstly concerned about the perspective that the West had of Muhammad, and secondly, he was, he was concerned of the effect that this vision that the West had would affect the later generations of Muslims. So to defend the Prophet Muhammad sallam, to present the Islamic narrative of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he wrote this book, the essays, uh, the essays on the life of Muhammad sallam. Now his most famous work and his most controversial work would be Tafsirul Quran, his commentary on the Quran, which would be a seven-volume book where he he would comment on the Quran, he would explicate his vision, his beliefs of Islam. This would be a very controversial uh, writing and he would be highly criticized for his unorthodox views, which later we would expound on. We will expound on. Now, it is a seven volume commentary of the Quran. He also wrote a detailed article called The Notes on the Principles of Commentary. We have 15 principles on uh, which he based his comment uh, on which he based his commentary on would be explicated. He also wrote several books on history, which was one of his favorite topics of interest. Now, in these book in these books, he would explore the history of India, of Delhi, and the Mughal Empire. In this genre, his most famous book was, was called, and forgive the pronunciation, Asrar Us-Sana'id, the, the remnant of the ancient heroes. The book was written in four parts. The first three parts were detailed of buildings, and the, sec uh, and the last part were the histories of inhabitants of the city of Delhi such as the Sufis, the poets, the uh, musicians, the artists, which, uh, who would come and settle later on in D Delhi. He uh, recorded their lives and what they did, and so on and so forth. There were also beautiful illustrations of buildings in this book. He gained wider fame and recognition amongst the scholars of history and the scholars around the world for this book, uh, through this book. And the book was also translated into French. Now, having explored his religious works, having explored his historical works, now we move on to the polit political works. The mutiny, as I previously mentioned, the mutiny of, nine, of 1857 was one of the most impactful events of Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan's life. And this would affect his political view and this would affect his political writings. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was in Bijnor. Bijnor, which was a city at the time where the revolt would take place. Now, in Bijnor, he was a uh, assistant, chief assistant officer for the court. 
and the uh, mutiny would take place uh, the muslim and the hindus would attack british officers so yeah the british uh, were attacked and a mutiny took place Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan was present he saw the whole thing he lost members he lost friends he lost people he knew and he took a strong stance with the British against his people but later on he would write of the causes of the causes that caused this mutiny his first book on these political matters would be the history of the Bijnor rebellion this was his first book where he would record the facts that took place during this event furthermore further on he wrote the causes of the indian revolt where he explained that the cause for this mutiny was not the resentment of the muslim elites who lost power this was the interpretation of the british empire they they thought that the muslim had lost the muslim elites were resentful because they had lost power but this was not the case rather sir sayyid ahmed khan presented another narrative a more powerful narrative where he blamed the, the british for their lack of understanding when it came to indian culture and their unjust policies against the indian population he blamed the british for the mutiny and he wrote extensively on their unjust policies and what they should do how they should reform the, uh, the, themselves first so that this would never happen again another book which he wrote would be against a man known as william wilson hunter a scottish historian who published the indian muslim are they bound in conscious to rebel against the queen this was an article published by william wilson hunter where he linked the wahhabi muslim movement to the rebellion and argued that the muslim were dangerous to the british empire this argument was one-sided and was seen as one-sided by the muslim population of india this led to a negative view of the muslim in british india to which sir sayyid ahmed khan rose rose with pride and wrote his review on hunter's indian muslims on this article that hunter wrote sir sayyid ahmed khan wrote a review where he would defend the muslim and refute hunter's argument this would preserve this would preserve the muslim this would bring pride to the muslim of india now we have finished a complete analysis of his work and of his writings having having um having expounded upon his writings we see that sir sayyid ahmed khan was a very active writer he dealt with the problem of his times he was he was concerned about the muslims of his time and this is the attitude that muslims nowadays must have we must not be a dead society we must not be a dead community we must react we must uh, be proactive we must write we must publish we must be in tune with what is happening around us this was what sir sayyid ahmed khan was doing and this was what made him so such a great personality now moving on to the educational contribution of sir sayyid ahmed khan we must we must know something very important he had a passion for education and most importantly he had a passion for educational reforms having gone through the traditional islamic education while pursuing studies in european jurisprudence he knew the advantages of western style education and he was opposed to the dogmas of the muslims at that time because the muslim thought the muslim dogma was that we need to preserve ourselves the british are evil the british are the devil if we copy them we are going to fail this was not a, a healthy view of life and sir sayyid ahmed khan was against this rather he wanted to implement what is good from the british and reject what is bad so he 
founded the modern madrasa. The modern madrasa. The madrasa system was a traditional system where students were taught the Arabic language, uh, the memorization of the Quran, the memorization of the Hadith, and several Islamic sciences. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan created the modern madrasa where he would teach Islamic studies as well as modern sciences such as biology, uh, physics, and chemistry. All types of modern sciences were taught. At the same time, Islamic uh, studies were, uh, were being taught. This was a revolutionary concept. Later on, he would create the scientific society. The scientific society is a very interesting uh, thing that Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan came with. They held annual conferences, distributed funds for educational purposes. Regular, they had regular publication of journals of, uh, on scientific subjects in both the Urdu language and English. He promoted rational reinterpretation of Islamic text. For example, he did not believe in the unseen such as jinns and angels. He did not believe in miracles, rather he reinterpreted miracles as sci in a scientific manner. This was uh, something that brought him much critic, and this was something that was not orthodox at all. Up till now it is not considered as orthodox views, but nevertheless he stuck to his principle and what he believed in. And this was what he saw as the best thing for the Muslims, to reinterpret their tradition in a new manner. He went to, a, to an extreme, certainly, but it was what he thought was good for the Muslims at that time. When it comes to education, his most important contribution must be the Muhammadiyan Anglo-Oriental College. After having visited England, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan came with a dream of establishing an institution similar to Cambridge and Oxford, uh, similar to Cambridge and Oxford, with an attached mosque. Now, uh, I believe that it was Cambridge or Oxford who had an attached church to them. So Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan proposed this idea that we will build a university similar to Cambridge and Oxford that would have an attached mosque, uh, an attached mosque, where both science, uh, both the sciences and religion would be taught, where Islamic principles would be observed, foul language, smoking, lies, and bad habits would be uh, prohibited, where Muslim boys would wear the fez cap, the red Turkish cap, pray five times a day, and religious differences between Shia and Sunni would be put aside in discussion, would not be discussed. This would create more Islamic unity, this would create a higher level of education, this would create more productive beings, uh, uh, human beings, and this would create a stronger Muslim community according to Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Hence, in the year 1875, his dream became a reality, and the Muhammadian Anglo-Oriental Anglo College was established. This was an incredible achievement. This was truly an incredible achievement, and it truly uh, pushed the Muslims at the forefront of educational reforms in British India. Later on, the Muhammadiyan Educational Conference was established. Its goal was the, uh, to educate, uh, to propagate education throughout India. That is the first goal. And the second goal was to turn the Muhammadiyan Anglos Oriental College into the, into the status of a university. Now, these were the educational uh, achievement of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, his educational reforms that he brought about. Now let us move on. What did, what was Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, uh, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan's political view, and what was his political achievements? Firstly, he believed that Muslims should not be active participants in politics. 
he believed that they should focus on themselves and not participate actively in politics. This was a view that he was highly criticized for by many Muslim uh, uh, groups as well as many Muslim thinkers individually criticized him for this. Another thing, at the start of his career, he was for Muslim Hindu unity. Muslim Hindu unity in India. So when the British would go away, he believed that the Muslims and Hindus must unite and be strong and firm together. For example, quoting him, he would say, Bear in mind, the Hindu and the Muslim are but religious word. All the Hindus, Muslims and Christian who live in this country are one nation. This is something he said. This is I'm quoting him right now. So he believed in Hindu Muslim unity in India. But later on, this view would change. This view would change. Later on, he started advocating for the two nation state fury. So he was the first amongst the first who came up with the two nation state uh, theory, which was, let me explain clearly. So when the British would leave India, knowing that there are two big, Mus uh, there are two big population, the Muslims, the Muhammadians on one side and the Hindus on another side. When the British take their tanks, they take their military power, they take their political power away, they go, they go back to Britain. What will happen to India? Will the Muslims be safe under Hindu rule? Will the Hindu be safe under Muslim rule? What is the future for this nation? So, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan came with a theory that when the British go away, there will be a fight for power. Hence, we need to separate. The Muslim must take a state and the Hindu another. Live side by side, but not mix together. This created the two-nation state theory, which would later be, uh, which would later be adopted by Allama Muhammad Iqbal, the famous poet and philosopher of India, and Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. He also championed the cause of the Urdu language because it was the symbol of Muslim cultural dominance in India. He fought to make the Urdu language the second official language of the United Provinces, opposing Hindi. There was a battle between Hindi and Urdu. Who would win? So the Hindus of India wanted Hindi to be the official language and the Muslim wanted Urdu to be the official language and Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan voted for Urdu and fought for it stating that I'm quoting Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan Urdu was the language of the gentry Me gentry meaning well-born uh, gentle and high-class people and Hindi was the uh, was the vulgar so it was a vulgar language, whereas Urdu was a gentry language, the language of the gentleman. Now, finally, we have explored the political aspects of his thinking. We, we saw that he advocated for mu uh, Hindu-Muslim unity. Later on, he adopted the two-nation theory. We saw that he advocated for the Urdu language. When it came to education, he established the, the Muhammadiyan Anglo Oriental College. Uh, moreover, we saw his writing, his religious writings, his tafsir of the Quran, his uh, writing on the true discourse, and so on and so forth, his political writing, his historical writing. We explored all of these. Now, let us see how Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was criticized. This is one of the most important parts of his life. He is one of the most criticized figure. He is one of the most controversial figure, even though he defended the Muslims against the Westerners, the British, against the Hindus. He established educational centers. He wrote books in defense of Islam. Even though he did all of that, he was highly criticized. Some considered him outside the fold of Islam. Some considered him as a non-believer when it came to Islamic beliefs. 
Why is that? Well, simply because of his unorthodox views that we are going to explore right now. When it comes to the criticisms, he was criticized, firstly, for, for the establishment of the Anglo-Oriental College, as it was seen as an unorthodox idea. And like Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, uh, was copying, it was seen as Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan copying the West. Now, the traditional Islamic thinkers, the traditional Islamic uh, the Orthodox Islam at that time did not agree with the establishment of Anglo-Oriental College. The Anglo-Oriental College, the Muhammadian Anglo-Oriental College, this was not uh, accepted by many Muslims because it was seen as an innovation, something new, something bizarre. What is he doing? So he was criticized for this and he w it was said that Sayyid Ahmad Khan was copying the Westerners. Another thing he was criticized for was being neo muhtazila Now, the Muhtazila in the Islamic doctrine are seen as a group, a deviant group of the Muslims. So, the Muslims have different groups, the Sunni, Shia, and so on. The Muhtazila is part of it. They are known as the rationalists, the extremist rationalists. And Sayyid Ahmed Khan adopted many of their views, hence he was seen as a neo muhtazila a neo Mu'tazila meaning he is a little bit deviant in those ways. He was also criticized by the great figure Jamaluddin al-Afghani, a reformer of, the, of that century. He was criticized uh, by Jamaluddin al-Afghani for siding with the British during the 18, uh, seven, uh, 1857 revolt, the mutiny that took place. He sided with the British, do you remember? So. Uh, Jamaluddin al-Afghani criticized him for that and for other religious reasons. He was also criticized for his commentary of the Quran, where he explained, where he, um, where he exposed many unorthodox ideas of his. For example, the non-existence of jinn. Now, jinn are beings created from fire and invisible to human beings. Jinns can come into our world, they can, they can see us, but we can't see them. Now, it is part, uh, the jinns are part of the unseen world. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, due to his extreme rationalism, denied the existence of the jinns. Another thing, he denied the existence of angels. The belief in angels is, is a primary belief that all Muslims must have. It is from amongst the articles of faith. So when he denied his uh, when he denied um, the existence of angels, it went contrary to the articles of faith, for which he was highly criticized. He was also criticized for his view on miracles. He believed that prophets could not perform miracles as we understand it. Miracles are must be reinterpreted in a scientific manner because it goes against science. He was also criticized for the riba. Riba meaning interest. He believed that interest, that one was allowed to take interest when it came to rich, the rich borrowing from a rich. Interest is allowed. But when you take money, when you, when you, uh, uh, when a poor person borrows from you, then you are not allowed to apply interest on it. This was not uh, the orthodox view at that time. Hence, he was once again criticized. He tried to make the Quran conform to science and judge the Islamic beliefs according to science, which was ever-changing. Science is not a, a fixed uh, view. If you study, it is not a fixed uh, thing as we, we think of it. If anyone studies the philosophy of science, you will discover that science is ever-changing, that you can assume something that is false, but gain results that are true and so on and so forth he based the quran which is an authentic book and which he believed came from god he tried to conform it to the uh, scientific ideas of the west this was clearly a mistake and he was also criticized for that he was criticized for his political views many uh, many 
thinkers of uh, many Muslim thinkers at that time criticized him because he said that Muslims must not take active role in politics and this was contrary to the Islamic thought at that time. Islam is a complete way of life. Islam is a complete way of life that englobes all, all uh, the aspects of human life, including politics, including how you sleep, including your worship, your relationship with God, including your relationship with others. Islam is a global religion. Islam is a deen, a way of life. Hence, um, hence uh, saying that Muslims should not be active in politics this was something that he would be criticized for. And for the obedience to the British Empire and loyalty to the British Empire, he preached loyalty to, British, to the British Empire, for which he was criticized. Also, he was deemed as kafir, as a, uh, someone who went outside the fold of Islam by many groups, uh, such as the Ahlul Hadith, the followers of uh, Shawaliullah Dahlawi, uh, and and much uh, and many more groups, he was criticized and viewed as a deviant. Now, even though there are all of these criticisms, we must still remember his contribution to education, to politics, to writing, to defending the faith of Islam. That is the first thing we must remember his contribution. But secondly, we must understand the context in which he lived. Now, let me give you the context. In a time where Muslims had lost power, political power, the Mughal, uh, the Mughal Empire, the Muslim Mughal Empire in India no longer had political power. The Muslim had lost so much. The Muslim were being attacked from all fronts. The Ottoman Empire was seen as the sick man of Europe. This was all taking place at that time where Muslims, a few years after, would no longer have the caliphate. This was extremely, extremely difficult on the Muslims. Now, the reaction was what? So, there are three reactions. We must understand that the British are coming into Muslim lands with greater military power, with greater, so greater social power, with greater political power, with power in all fronts, attacking the Muslims on all fronts and attacking them ideologically. And how do the Muslims respond? In India, there, are, there were three different uh, reactions. The first reaction was conserv um, conserving the tradition. So, the first reaction, the first group of Muslims reacted in this way. Okay, the British came here. They are bringing new ideas. They are bringing new ways of life. They are bringing new educational systems and so on and so forth. We are losing our ancestry, we are losing our heritage, we are losing our tradition, and we must preserve them. So, they decided to preserve their tradition, they decided to pre preserve their customs. This was the reaction of the Tablighi Jamaat and uh, the Daybandi movement. Then we have a second movement. This was a more balanced approach, this was a more middle way approach. It was the approach of Allama Muhammad Iqbal. It would be the approach of Abu al-A'la Maududi in India. What was this approach? Well, we take what is good from them and we reject what is bad. This was a more balanced approach. So, they would see the British and they would judge the British based on Islamic values. And whatever is good Islamically th that the British brought, these people would take it on. And they would not shy away from their Islamic beliefs. They would stand up for it and they would be proactive and uh, not reactive. This was the middle path. This was um, another approach by, uh, taken on by Allama Muhammad Iqbal and uh, Sir, uh, and, I mean, Muhammad Allama Iqbal and Abu Allama Maududi. Not only that, but they defended the Islamic beliefs, they defended the Islamic faith in a way that brought pride to the Muslims. Allama Muhammad Iqbal, for example, defended the Islamic beliefs when it came to philosophical attacks by Nietzsche, by Goethe, and so on and so forth. Allama um, Abu Allama Maududi, he, he defended Islam when it came to political thought, when it came to jihad, for example, when it came to Islamic principles, he upheld 
uh, upholded them. Then there is a third reaction, that is the reaction of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. This third reaction was one based on science. Okay, they said, okay, the British are stronger than us militarily, intellectually, physically, politically, and so on and so forth. What do we do now? Their approach was, well, we have to do what they did in order to reach their level. So they started to judge Islam based on science, based on what the British brought. This was a reactive approach and not a very good one. But nevertheless, it was something that they thought at that time. This was a framework. This was three, three reactions, three different reactions to the British Empire in India. So firstly, we have the conservatives. Secondly, we have the middle approach. And thirdly, we have the, scientist, the scientific approach. We might say. It's not a good term, but it's the best I have right now. Now, moving on, what is the legacy that uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan uh, left? And this is the last part. Firstly, he left the two-nation theory, which would lead to the formation of Pakistan, which would lead to, the, uh, which, which would lead to influencing uh, Allama Muhammad Iqbal and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He also built the Aligarh University. Uh, he also was... Um, uh, part of the foundation, uh, like he inspired the Aligarh University, which was one of the, f uh, which is one of the finest educational centers for Muslims in India. He is, uh, his face is printed on the seventy-five uh, rupees note in Pakistan. He influenced Muhammad Iqbal. He influenced Muhammad Iqbal, who was the poet and philosopher of the uh, Indian subcontinent. He influenced Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who would form Pakistan. He influenced the great Islamic scholar, Abul, uh, Abul Kalam Azad. He influenced the great scholar, once again, Shibli Nu'mani. The university established, um, the university that Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan established, the Aligarh University, educated la creme de la creme of the Muslim society, such as Muhammad Ali Jauhar, which, uh, who would become a, a famous journalist and a scholar and would, uh, would be prolific in writing. Maulana Shaukat Ali, who would, who would be part of the Caliphate, Caliphate movement that would lead to the, uh, to the expulsion of the British from India and the independence of India. And, he, uh, and, and this university also educated two prime ministers of Pakistan. This was the legacy of the great uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan and a man that we must remember for his contributions, for his positivity and his negative parts must be, must not be overlooked, but his positive contribution were much more than his negative contribution. And with that, I leave you with the greeting of Islam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.